would like to call to order the special meeting of the Mayor and Board of Aldermen for Tuesday, September the 8th. We have John Morgan attending the meeting by telephone. All other board members are here. We are going to uh, begin by discussing our Serving Oxford Safely plan. And as we always do when we start to consider this plan, I'm gonna ask Jimmy Allgood to come up and give us an overview of our numbers today, please, sir. Okay, uh, for today, the numbers that came in, uh, we're sitting at a total cases for Lafayette County of 1,791. That's a uh, 13, uh, 13 case increase over yesterday. The state's cases came in today at uh, 249 total and with zero deaths. First time since March that the state has had zero deaths. Uh, so that, that's our basic numbers for today. John Morgan has just reminded me that I did not have you all adopt the agenda. So I'm sorry, I got ahead of, was that to you or John? Um, so it's not on the agenda and I missed it. So could I have a motion to adopt to the agenda as it's printed? So moved. Second. All in favor? Uh, Any opposed? All right, uh, sorry, Jimmy. Back, oh, no. to, um, back to Jimmy. So oh. we've had a total of 1,791 today Correct. to date. To date. And we had 13. 13 new cases today. Okay. Uh, the, the one thing I did want to point out in the past 15 days, we've increased 614 total cases. Uh, that is a 34% of our total cases that we have, we have went up in the past 15 days. So, so a little bit over one third of our cases have came in the past 15 days. And Jimmy, the um, figures. Hey, Carol, would you mind closing that door? It's so loud in the hallway. Thank you. The figures that we're looking at in the New York Times, which everybody is talking about, are are those accurate? They're talking about Oxford being like third in the country with the percentage of. With the percentage, it, it, yes, ma'am. Uh, they, they they're correct on that. We're, as far as a hot spot goes, with the number of new cases, based on the number uh, on the population. Uh, Yes, ma'am. The state overall is going down. Right. Mm -hmm. We, as a county, are going up. Yeah, we but are as a county, but unfortunately, the New York Times is printing it as Oxford, Mississippi. Yes, ma'am. And and and, they, and we're not we're not broken out. Which is not county. correct. That's right. With a population of fifty-four thousand. Yeah. Correct. I mean, so, but correct. they're not saying that. So it's the All county right. and the university are. They're not. Correct. They're not differentiating. That those are not included, but they are. Right. That's right, it is, it's all of it. Um, hospital data, um, it was updated about 15 minutes ago. Um, I have been waiting on it all day long. Jimmy and I have both been hitting refresh on that for most of the day. Um, as of this morning, there were 10 people in ICU at our hospital. Our hospital has 24 ICU beds. There were 10 people in ICU and six of those were COVID related. So plenty of ICU beds available. We have a total of 181 beds staffed at Baptist Memorial Hospital, North Mississippi. And today, 65 of those are available. This morning, there were 29 hospitalized with COVID. Now I spoke with Bill Henning yesterday and he stated that very few under the 29 year old age bracket have been seen at the hospital. You know, that is where the majority of our increases are coming from is that 18 to 24 year old age bracket. He said very few of those have been seen. I was hoping to get to talk to him today to, to discuss, does that mean very few have been seen in the ER? Have any been hospitalized? I don't know the answer to that. I've seen a lot of people post that no one has been hospitalized, but I don't know where they, if that's their gut feeling or if that, um, if they have a fact that, that I don't know about. But um, I wasn't able to get in touch with Bill again today to, to find out that information. But he did say that very few under the age of 29 have been seen at the hospital. Overall, the hospitalizations were down. For those of you who have followed along, um, a month ago, you know, we were talking about what's our weekly average number of people that are hospitalized with COVID each day. And for about a month, it was hanging at about in the 50s. Um, this week, it has been, for the past week, it's been in the 20s. It's at 29 today, but it is, it is hanging in the 20s. So even as we are seeing our cases go up, as far as positive cases go up, 
we are seeing our hospitalizations go down, which is trending along with the rest of the state right. as far as our hospitalizations go. So, it, you know, and I think that that is just a direct relation to the age group where we are seeing these large increases. Um, I have gotten quite, quite a few calls, as I'm sure many of you have, emails and social media comments about the University of Mississippi's bid day activities. Anybody who has seen social media in the past day or so has seen large groups of people without masks on hugging each other and getting their pictures made with their arms around each other. And um, Chancellor Boyce called me this morning. The university had a meeting about that and, and he was very upfront and he said, unfortunately, um, a university official apparently granted permission for those bid day gatherings to happen. And he was disappointed and I shared with him that we were too, that this community has worked so hard to um, get a plan in place and the members of our community and our businesses have worked so hard that, you know, those gatherings were in violation of the governor's order. Not, not anything that we've put in place and they aren't in the city. So it wouldn't, it's not things that we've put in place, but they do violate the governor's orders. And he, he was sick that it happened, um, as you can imagine. We did talk about the social gatherings and how the Oxford Police Department continues to enforce the requirements that we have in place. They have written 42 citations for people violating the social gathering requirements since August the 18th. Chancellor Boyce, um, the, the university has provided those names when students violate that social gathering policy. And um, Chancellor Boyce told me this morning that student conduct is calling those students in and there's a fine and an education program associated if anyone is found to have um, a second violation, then um, the, they've not had that happen yet, but if they did, then they would consider suspending that student. Um, so that, that's where we are there. I, the university is a great partner to us and unfortunately really dropped the ball on this one. Um, so like I said, 42 violations since August 18th. So Janice was talking to me yesterday about this example and I thought it was so good that I wanna share it because I think that part of the issue that we're dealing with, and I feel like I'm just a mom wagging my finger at people all the time and I, I hate that role, but I, I do believe that we are at a place and I've said this numerous times before where I don't know that further restrictions are making a large difference. It's personal behavior that has to come in to make this difference. So let's say the students, I think, are not, they, most of them, by all reports, are asymptomatic. And so they don't have the concern that a lot of people have about getting it or about spreading it. So if an asymptomatic person goes to a party at someone's condo, they don't know they're spreading it, they're asymptomatic. They give it to somebody else at that party who is also asymptomatic. Well, that person goes home this weekend to see their parents and their family and their Aunt Sue comes over to visit and that asymptomatic person gives it to Aunt Sue and then Aunt Sue goes to work at the VA home and then 26 people die. 26 people have died at our VA home, 26. You know, I fear that we say these numbers like they're just numbers. Those are, I went to the VA home this afternoon, they had a drive-through parade to see all these folks outside getting some sunshine. And as I was looking at them, I was thinking, they've all lost their dearest friends, the people that they've lived next door to, shared rooms with. And we're talking about it like it's numbers. And we're acting like, well, I won't get that sick, or I won't pass it, or I won't, it's not gonna be me. And I just, you know, I just had to share that story that that is the concern. It's not because we're worried about what the number increase looks like. It's because we care about people and we know the effects that irresponsible partying can have. And I think that's what we're seeing. You know, we have had a total of 38 deaths in this community so far. 26 of those were at the VA home. Four at one long-term care facility and one at another long-term care facility. So we have gotten quite a few emails um, from people saying, what are you gonna do? And I've gotten lots of social media comments and things, and I know many of you have as well, saying, y'all have to do something. As 
some point in time, and I know that there are people that don't want to hear this, but it, at some point in time, you can't legislate folks to have good behavior. You can't force people to do the right thing. And, you know, I said this a while back, we can't make them care. We need people to care enough to do these things. And so, you know, I really, I hope that our student population, we wouldn't be this place without these students. We would not be, and, and so we so appreciate them. We'd be any small town in Mississippi if we did not have these energetic, enthusiastic residents come into, into our community. But we have worked so hard, and I want, I want to see us be able to move forward. Um, contact tracing is indicating that the spread of this virus is coming primarily from social gatherings. It is not tracing back to gyms. It is not tracing back to restaurants and bars. It's not even tracing back to the schools where everybody thought it would just, you know, be rampant by now. It is tracing back to large social gatherings. And so as much as people want us to, you know, we've gotten, I know many of you have received as well, emails saying, please close down indoor dining. You're gonna hear us today talk about expanding our dining options to outdoor. And that is what we're trying to do is find safer ways to provide that dining. But we aren't seeing cases traced back to our restaurants. So blaming and penalizing our restaurants and bars is, you know, it's easy for us to do. And it's one of the things that we have the authority to say, this is what you have to do. And, and but we're, we're our best mm -hmm. example of that, our own best example. Our restaurants and bars were open for several months before the students came back, but we had enough student population here that they populated the bars and restaurants. And we did not see a spread coming from that. We did not see the spread until they came back and the out, off campus, outside social activities began. That's right, and and you know, it, it, would be, it would be one thing if we, I don't think anybody on this board would hesitate to say no more indoor dining if we were seeing it point to that as, um, the place that it was being um, transferred. But, you know, the bars and restaurants are seating, I just wanna remind our community, only at 50% capacity. There are social distancing between all of the tables. People are not allowed to stand and socialize. They have to be seated at tables. Um, and most nights, Officer Police Department reports that it's not crowded. There have been nights that it is and that there are lines waiting. And we are encouraging people and requiring people to wear masks outdoors while they are waiting in these lines and to be socially distanced. But um, the, the contact tracing indicates that this spread is coming from social gatherings. Um, so if we want our caseload to decrease, then it's gonna take personal responsibility, which we've known. The New York Times headline today is, parties and COVID-19 outbreaks threaten university reopenings in the US. It, there's a list that the New York Times has been publishing about where, I can't remember the title, where is the spread or hot where, hotspots. Hot yeah, it's kind of, it's detailing, and Oxford is number three on that list. Carol went through the list today of the top 20 on that list. All 20 have a college in their town. Yeah. It's because you have to expect these numbers to increase like that when you bring in here 15,000, other places probably 50,000 people to your small town or large city that come from places all over and have been traveling all summer and that, you know, that kind of thing. So it's not unexpected, but it is, um, it is concerning nevertheless. The good news for our community is that our healthcare system is tracking right along and people are not being turned away at the hospital and we are not close to being in that position. Um, we are not seeing the majority of our cases um, be very ill or even need hospitalization, much less ICU or ventilators. And you know, a lot of people will say, well, people aren't even getting sick, who cares? I mean, as long as they're not being hospitalized, you know what, those 26 veterans at the VA home is why I care. And it's why we have to be diligent in keeping this spread down. So um, the first thing that I would like to ask you to, some of these things um, different members of our community have brought up for us to talk through and others are um, just things that either I've heard y'all mention or not, but the, um, 
sign ordinance enforcement. We talked about um, a while back that we would start um, implementing our sign ordinances again on September the 1st. Um, and then we kind of all, I think, and that's, that was the motion. Then we casually discussed, oh, we're not where we thought we'd be on September the 1st. We're still really in the middle of this thing and there are still restaurants that are, some are doing curbside still, some have just started dining in and they need signage to tell that. Um, Michael Brown, our sign enforcement guy, has been doing his diligence and has been going around and talking to businesses. But I believe that we should just be giving reminders now and not asking people to take signage down as we just are not as far along as we had hoped. And as we talk about outdoor dining again in a minute, um, that's gonna require signage and tents and things as well that are probably not going to meet our sign ordinance. And so I don't believe it's fair for us to be implementing it in some portions of the city and not all. So I wanted to ask you all for an extension on that for our businesses. Right, so are we, we extending, because you said something about giving, giving, him, giving them reminders, but are we extending the, the non-compliance of the sign ordinance? And that's what I would like to do is extend the non-compliance of the sign ordinance so it allow these businesses to promote however they would like to. Oh, let me remind you why we said we were gonna give them reminders and then y'all y'all decide whatever y'all's pleasure is is what we'll do. We said that we saw some people that were spending a lot of money on signs that were non-compliant and we feared that it, the toothpaste was kind of getting out of the tube and we were gonna go back in a few weeks and say, hey, those aren't compliant. You know what I mean? And so we were giving people reminders so that they would not go invest in more expensive signage <laughs> that we were going to say, okay, your time's up September the 1st. Yeah. So that's why we had said we were gonna give reminders, but whatever y'all, however y'all want us to handle I think, it, just. I think for us, I think we ought to look at taking it to December 1st, that would get us through football season. That would be good. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, October, November, December. Well, if we're gonna go, if we're gonna do the, if we're looking at doing the outdoor dining option, um, I don't know what date then we need to extend it to at this point. Uh, I'd like to. Why don't, you, like why to don't we say December first now, and then if you decide you want it to go yeah, later, like we can. But I'd that like gives everybody. Side with the outdoor dining. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that would be good. No, that's LSU. It's at LSU. Uh -uh. It's, it's, it's changed so many times. None of us can keep up with it. Twenty eight is the last. Yeah. Yes. Record that just because you're suspending it for this period doesn't mean you're grandfathered in if you put in a non-compliant sign. I hope maybe, uh, as I just point out, I just wanted to let that mayor remind you that this is a temporary sign. Um, I think even a continuing to enforce a permanent sign is required. That's exactly what I said. There you go. <laughs> there you go. That's what Jason said. Okay, so is that a motion? And is December 1st the date? Yeah, let's do December 1st sure. for right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. I'll second. Okay. Yeah, all in favor? Uh, Any opposed? Uh, all right. Um, all right, M Trade Park, we'll do that one next. And Brad is here, and Brad and I have talked through this today, and well, lots of times, but the latest today. Um, and Brad and Clay, I just wanna thank them in front of all of you, first of all, because of the number of hours that they have put in trying to figure out how to safely operate so that kids can still enjoy sports outside. I'm not sure if the kids or the parents enjoy it more actually, but um, but the, the, the links that they have gone to to figure this out and to diagram it and to publicize it and to work with the tournament promoters and planners and to deal with angry parents that arrive at the field and to ask people to put on masks when it's hot as heck. And uh, you know, I just wanna thank y'all. I, I thanked them to them, but I want the board to know as well the work that has gone into this. Um, and I spoke with Brad this morning about, um, about M-Trade Park and upcoming tournaments. 
And you, uh, you know that we, we all discussed last time, I think he had a tournament that was going to be in the 40 team neighborhood and he was talking about the way that he would do that. And, and we talked about p limiting the number of teams. And I think you'll probably all remember the conversation that that's a very difficult thing to do because what matters more is how many are in each age bracket at each of the quads and is there a majors and a triple A and a how many playoff games where there'll be and those kinds of things. So we realized quickly that it really, limiting the number of teams doesn't give us the desired result. The, the desire for us is that we only have the number of people in that facility that is can safely social distance and spread out. And so I think that Brad has a good plan. There are some large tournaments coming up, some tournaments that we inherited from South Haven when they closed their part down for renovations that are coming up. But when you compare those numbers and the way that it can be safely accommodated by limiting the fans that come, I don't believe you can, uh, you can think that SEC football is going to be you know, with 30,000 people coming in will be a, a safer venue. So anyway, I'll let Brad kind of give the, the way he plans on facilitating yeah. that. Well, thank you for those kind words. And it is like building a helicopter in the air, you know, when we're, <laughs> when we're kind of doing this. Um, so we've met, Clay and I have met with Mayor and Bart a handful of times. And ever since we started these events back, like the 1st of June, we, we've tried a, a, a couple of different ways. and. What Clay and I have learned through this time is the, the safest way to operate the, these, these events is to limit the number of spectators that, that come through the gate. Now you may have some sitting outside, but actually that come through the gate so they can safely social distance. Um, we've come up with a plan to where each team would get anywhere from 25 to 30 tickets per team, which is about a little bit, it's, it's close to a good team average. Um, once those people enter the quad, so that's only 240 people, spectators in a quad at any one given time. Now our quads, and I don't know how familiar y'all are with, with the scope of our, kind of the footprint of our quads, and our smallest quad can easily fit Walmart Supercenter inside of it, so that kind of gives you a, a feel for it. Um, you know, by doing that, um, what we've seen is that when you limit the number of people in there, people can spread out safely, um, huge distances. And then we're also spreading game times out. So there's not this rush, you know, coming in. Um, so, and after talking with Bart and Mayor, we feel like that's gonna be our route moving forward. Um, we feel it's a good plan. We feel it's a, the, the safest way to, to kind of facilitate our events moving forward. And Brad, let me know that most teams have 12 to 15 players. So when you're saying 25 to 30 tickets, that's about two, two people per player. So um, that's where they came up. We had talked about, you know, one of their first tournaments they led in to each person got two attendees yeah. or what have you. So this, this works out to be very similar. It's very similar. It's a, you know, it's just, we feel doing it a couple different ways, this is the best way to do that, to kind we've, of help with crowd control. We've gotten some feedback, I know Mark has too, from people that have gone out there and said, oh my goodness, there's so many, there are thousands of people there and what have you. But, you know, I do think that the parking lot is so big and a lots of times families arrive in a couple of different vehicles and the perception is that, but mm -hmm. um, the tournament that they thought that to be the case, there were only two fields out of every four being used and every other soccer field. So, I, you know, and when we talk, another thing that Brad made me realize is that when we talk about 40 teams being there and everybody's like, oh, 40 teams, there are never 40 there at the same time. That's how many total teams there are in the tournament. And another um, thing that was comforting to me is that each age group doesn't leave that quad. Like you play on that same field or in that same quad all of your games. So it's not like all these different groups are mingling as they go. It's, you know, they are contained in that one age group quad. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I have to, we, if you just were to drive by and you're just, it's kind of like sticker shock, oh my gosh, look at how many cars, you know, you're spread out over a hundred acre facility. Um, it's outdoors and people are, are kind of, the, they're learning our protocols and they go to these other events. And so we've seen better participation, especially with masks lately. 
because um, that was implemented maybe a month ago or so. Yeah, so. he said this weekend they had really good mask participation yeah. without a lot of harassing. It's so. getting better. That's, that's positive, but I just wanted to bring this back up to you all because we, you know, we've kind of talked back and forth about do we limit teams, do we, what do we do? So I wanted to make sure that you all are comfortable with this and ask Brad any questions that you have. So we're talking baseball right now, what are you doing for soccer? Soccer, we don't have any events on the horizon, um, any, any big events. Um, so we're trying, now, you know, when we built our schedule pre-COVID, especially with kind of everything in mind. Rick, um, my understanding is that we have more kids and people out there with OPC soccer than we have with tournaments. And that is going to start back. Yeah. It's, so it's that, back. you know, the, the soccer crowd with um, OPC is really a larger crowd than, we do see that people that are from Oxford, like the OPC crowd, already know the mask stuff and the social yeah, distancing. Yeah, We've already trained them, you know, they're <laughs> so good. They're, they um, actively participate, willingly participate. So. so one of the concerns, and I don't know that we could do anything about this, is the number of people that not only the, these tournaments are going to bring into town, but the tournaments on the same day as the football games. Mm -hmm. are, there's, we just need to know that there's going to be a lot of people in town. Yeah, the, yes, ma'am. There are. You know, uh, I, I never thought we'd say this, but uh, half these people that are coming to town, they're coming from places that are doing better than Oxford. So it's not like the old days where we're afraid they're going to spread it to us. We have a higher rate here is what I'm saying. Right. We, um... Our goal is to be able to bring our businesses back as safely yeah. as we can. And I do believe that encouraging outdoor events like this is, you know, is the safest way to um, return to some semblance of what we remember this time last year. So any other questions for Brad? Are y'all comfortable with this plan that he's presenting? If so, I'd like us to have a motion so that we know moving forward what the process is because we've just kind of revisited it with each tournament based on how many teams and that kind of thing. I don't have a problem with it. I think it's a good, safe plan. And again, I think the outdoor activities are good and safe and is what we need. So I'll, I'll make that motion to proceed with his plan. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you, Brad. Thanks, guys. Um, all right, does anybody, I should ask this too, this doesn't regard tournaments, but anybody have any issues with proceeding with OPC events? Are y'all fine with proceeding there? We had said as long as schools were open that we would kind of follow their lead on that. So, okay. Um, and so we'll talk about restaurants and we may end up kind of morphing into our next, which is discussing outdoor dining options for restaurants. But let's start with some of our serving Oxford safely restaurant topics and then um, we'll switch over. Um, Bart and Kara and I had a meeting and uh, several people from Visit Oxford came to a meeting with restaurant owners from the downtown area last week and a lot of different questions came up. One that pertains to serving Oxford safely, many of the restaurant owners um, asked us to please propose to the board that the restaurants be able to stay open until 11 instead of closing at 10. The governor's order states 11. Um, our order states 10, and we can be stricter but not more lenient than the governor's order. Um, you know, I talked to Chief McCutcheon about all of these parties that we're seeing. He said that really more of these were earlier in the night. They aren't people who are going to the bar and then leaving at 10. They're starting at this house and staying there, and the party grows. Is that a fair assessment, Chief? So, you know, I don't know... Some of the arguments that I have heard are, you know, at least if they're at the downtown establishments um, or any restaurant or bar in town, then they are having to go by, you know, the social distancing and they can't stand and socialize up to y'all. Um, that, that is, um, that's one I'm just putting in y'all's court to discuss. But the, the two things that they requested that we bring up was closing times and then if the board did not decide to extend to 11 o'clock p.m., 
and I didn't give them any hope that that would happen, but it, it's totally up to y'all. Um, if that did not happen, would you all think about um, home football game weekends when people are there and the, the last ESPN kickoff is at 8 p.m. So, <clears throat> you know, the game is not over at 10. Um, is it safer or not to push everybody out at 10 o'clock? I think we, we need to leave the closing time at 10. You know, just the, the perception of our, our own citizens that we're backing up on, you know, a, a pretty minimal requirement for the bars and restaurants. I would like for it to stay at 10. No, I, I agree. I, I okay. I've already had COVID, so nobody freak out. Chugging out there? Got a little chugging. Well, you know, from, from talking, <coughs> from talking with some some of the uh, students that are my kids' age, people are not going to the bars as much as they were because of the ten o'clock closure. I, I personally, I think the eleven o'clock closure may help us with some of the uh, uh, with some of the parties. I mean, I mean, it, it's I don't have a problem being more strenuous on our uh, on our penalties for for the parties, you know, for the house parties, but, but I actually think that we're better off having them in a place like that. I, I don't have a problem going to 11. Yeah, that's that's the one thing I'm seeing is that they're either not going to bars and leaving, or leaving the bars at 10 and then going in social gathering. I've, I've looked at it on my phone at several different places where they're gathering at pools or cotton club at night and they're not socially distancing, so, um, and, and the one thing is, is, that, is the outbreak's not coming from the bars. I mean, it's not coming from the restaurants and bars, and I think an additional hour to give these businesses some time to make money uh, is something that is needed and welcomed. Well, well do you I think that the close at 10, you don't think the, uh, I mean, the level, the are still going to it. Well, but there again, it gives the it gives the businesses another another hour because they're at fifty percent capacity, and we're, we, you know, the governors cut their cut their ability to make money even at eleven, um, and they've got they've got you know it's a business. I mean, they need to make they need to make money. I agree, and, and a lot of what goes on from after 10 o'clock is just drinking. People loosen up when, when they've had a lot to drink and the masks come off and the so, social distancing is goes to the wind. So, um, I, I mean, I think we're safer at 10 o'clock. I'm gonna make a motion that we retain the 10 o'clock time. Second. All right, any other discussion? I think yeah, we, we've been doing that. We did okay. that, yeah. Yeah, we, we have been letting people finish in our dining establishments. Yeah. Just um, that out if, to let yes, know. sure. Absolutely, know. absolutely. And Chief McCutcheon and I talked about that again this week. It, it, that is yeah, our downtown awesome. folks and those um, that are enforcing across the community know that at 10 o'clock service stops, but that people are certainly allowed to finish their meals and, and and we will be able to accommodate that as long as people don't take advantage of it but you know if if we find that people do then we'll have to be more stringent but our, our goal is to let people finish their meal you know I just want to make one comment before, before we vote on this uh, the, the Janice what you're saying about is people get a little they, they drink in and they take their mask off that's nothing compared to what these people are doing at house parties there are no masks I know. I mean, it's it, it's not even. I mean, 
you know, it's not even compared I know that, John. to what's I, I mean, going we just on. Need to, I know, okay. We need to manage everything. Uh, you know, we're trying to deal with house parties and, and people drinking at the bars. I mean, it's just another hour, and it's a bad hour, is my point. People are finished eating. There's no more food service in, in most of the restaurants or bars. We had this discussion when we talked about this the first time, where, and we've talked about this for years with our alcohol ordinance, et cetera. You know, basically last call, even though we don't differentiate between restaurants and bars, and just the last call. I mean, I wouldn't mind service stopping at 10, but I'd like to be able to stay open till 11. Well, um, and I know we talked about that last time, and the enforcement of that is, is difficult, difficult, et cetera. You know, I'm still of the opinion we have better control of them in the bars than we do at a house party. That's what we just said is you stop service at 10. I mean, that's what we just made public. That's right. So. Well, the, you know, I will tell you that we have answered 138 party calls in the past month. Um, we normally average 60. Um, we're on pace right now to be about 120 in September if we, try, if we keep tracking along like we have been just this first week of September. Um, so, you know, will it decrease the house parties if we are open until 11? No, I don't no. know the answer to that. I, you know, I, I can, um, I feel like nobody, none of these students are going home at 11, so I don't know that it decreases it, but I also have heard Chief McCutcheon say that a lot of the parties, because of closing at 10, I would suspect, are not ever going to the bar, they are, you know, the parties are earlier in the night. So it is, um, it is y'all's call. We have a motion and second. Are there any other comments before we vote? It's not a motion that's stopping service at 10? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they were closed at 10. They not closed at 10, closed stopping at service at 10. 10. Right. Stopping and alcohol service at 10. Does that go along with the football games and everything? And then I was going to say, uh, Mayor, I, I, I want to make a motion after this, if this fails, I want to make a motion to go 11 o'clock at the football game weekend if, uh, if I mean, that fails if this motion passes. Okay. Well, we have a motion for service to be suspended at, to, to remain. Really, it's no change. There's no change. No change. Right. Service stopping at 10. We allow people to finish their meals, their meals. but not to order anything past 10 o'clock yeah i guess i mean it wouldn't it wouldn't change but we you know we had a discussion about it yeah i think i mean i think we vote and yeah. then yeah, if, if it doesn't pass then we'll have john's mm -hmm. motion sure. okay so a motion and a second those in favor of remaining how we are now Please signify by saying aye. Aye. And those opposed, nay. 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 All right. So we will stay as we are at 10 o'clock. Um, is there discussion regarding football weekends? Or do you, did you say that's for Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go quickly. I'll make a motion that we allow 11 o'clock on Friday and Saturdays of football game weekend. Second. All right, any discussion on that? Okay, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. 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 Okay, so four to three, the motion passes. So the service is suspended after 10 p.m. on, uh, continues to be the case, on home football game weekends, on Fridays and Saturdays, um, the closing time will be per the governor's order of 11 o'clock p.m. Is that correct? Okay. All right. So um, now as we go into outdoor dining options, I think that's really all that goes along with serving Oxford safely. Um, the rest that we will um, address has to do more with our outdoor dining options. So you have a chart in front of you. These are the people who have, like I said, we had a meeting with the restaurant owners, and I, I want to reiterate that 
we are saying downtown restaurants because downtown restaurants don't own any of their own parking. Um, restaurants across the city obviously can do the same thing, but they wouldn't need our permission because they would be doing outdoor dining on their own property. So the reason that we are having this discussion and it only pertains to downtown is because they would have to use um, municipally owned property in order to facilitate outdoor dining. We found out just as a quick refresher that um, we could not make a donation of that property. We did ask for an attorney general's opinion to see under a state of emergency if that would be a possibility. Um, we were told by the attorney general it would be a 75 day turnaround on getting an opinion. We understand that by the time we received it, the whole potential for outdoor dining would have expired. It would be Christmas. So we, um, move forward with the only legal way to do that without an exemption by the Attorney General, which was to seek two appraisals and to average those appraisals, and then we adopted a resolution to declare those property surplus. I'm looking at you, Pope, to make sure I get this right. Am I getting this right? Yes, next, I don't think we will adopt the resolution next Tuesday. Okay. We talked about the, the different issues surrounding it. Okay. So as we met with the restaurant owners, they posed quite a few questions that um, I would like to get y'all's input on now. Next Tuesday at our regularly scheduled meeting, we'd like to have the leases ready for these properties because we're, they're missing time when outdoor dining would be yeah. prime time. So a few things that I want to talk through with you all. We discussed um, at our last meeting that the rate um, would be $192.50 per month for each space. Those are based on the average of the two appraisals. We can charge more but not less than what the average of the two appraisals are and that the average is $192.50. Um, a couple of issues to throw out to you. The first is we have several, or maybe just one, but that wants to rent for several different properties who would like to offer outdoor dining only on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. So I wanted to ask you all, we have, we have told them that our obligation would be to provide them with our metal bike rack looking barriers to define their spaces so that they would not have to invest in anything to mark off their space. And my understanding is that if it's for AB, that ABC requires them to have a designated area defined. So, you know, we ordered several hundred of those a while back. And so we will allow them to utilize those. And um, so several want to do it just three days a week. How, what do y'all think about that? I, I think it's fine. I want us to do whatever we can do to allow them to get outside because it's really a safer way for people to dine. I don't see any problem with that. Mm -hmm. If you know, we can prorate the, uh, the lease, the rent on the space. And you see what the, um, what the prices per day would yeah. be. So um, it'd be $106.40 $106 per month if they did that. So um, I just wanted to make sure with you all that you were fine because that's not how we discussed it yeah. in our first meeting. Our, our agreement was to do it by month. So what I'm asking y'all, you know, one thing that the restaurants will have to know is that they're in charge of the setup every, th you know, when they take it down and put it up and take it down and put it up. So, um, so are, will they take down the barricades and put them up or are they, they will? Well, the first time we will go put them out, but if they decide to do a back and forth, then they will they be responsible yeah. for that. We, you know, we just don't have the manpower sure. to do that every week. So, but we will do it the first time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, I, and the reason I don't think it ever occurred to me to do it on a daily basis or what have you is, I was just thinking nobody would want to go to the trouble of setting up. I, I'm picturing them putting down AstroTurf and getting tents set up and different things that I can't imagine anybody wants to take that down and put it back up. But if they do, then so be it. So um, anyway, just wanted to check to see if that was okay with y'all. And then the yes. other thing, we are allowing other dining uh, establishments throughout the city to do outdoor dining. If they do not have an established outdoor dining area, they can use their parking lot mm -hmm. for that area. They could do that now, yes. Yeah. I mean, that's okay. their I just own. I wanna make sure that, because you get a lot of, well, y'all allowing this 
squares, you're Absolutely. not doing anything for us. So. That's right. The the people that are not located, located downtown have the ability to do that year round. That is their property and they, they can, can do that. I can say it's easier for them. They're on private property and it's between them yeah, but with the parking, their landlord and ABC. Well, with the parking regulations, um, we just want to make sure that we're not violating that. Because I mean, you have to have a certain amount of parking spaces for a restaurant. You have to have a certain amount of parking space for office. Fair enough. But so they do need to deal with ABC as far as ex expanding their uh, alcohol. Well, that's right. That's right. Um, okay, so everyone good with it being a few days. I did tell the restaurant owners, our goal here is to help you stay in business and increase your capacity and offer dining in a safer environment. So if you do this for a month, and you say, this didn't work for me, I didn't even make back what I invested in it, you can stop. You know, we're not, we're not gonna say, well, you're locked in for three months. You, you know, we, this is to help our restaurants. And so, uh, you know, I just want y'all to know that, that we may have some that give it a try and then say, that just didn't, my customers didn't wanna sit outside. So anyway, um, then we will allow it to be um, several days a week if that is what they would prefer. They will have to, or either they'll have to, I mean, I would be yeah. fine with them renting the spot all mm -hmm. month and only offering it three days a week if they wanted to, but yes, they will be responsible. We just don't have the manpower to come in and do that every week, so. Um, Mayor, while we were talking, I got a text message from a, a square business owner, not a non-restaurant business owner, who was concerned about um, reducing the parking for other businesses, and they say that, um, a lot of people won't park in the garage and walk a couple of blocks and that they'll, if they can't find a parking spot, they'll go someplace on Jackson Avenue. I think we need to uh, let these other businesses know that we're only talking about 26, 26. parking yeah, spots. Yeah, 26 parking spots. Yeah, it's just not that many that I think that's, they should be concerned. Well, we have had- Look at the position, if you look at the position of the parking spots, they're mainly right in front of restaurants. Right. Correct. I mean, it's separate too. Um, so y'all look at your map, if you would, and let me point a few things out to you. Um, and which goes along, if you'll just look at your map as we're having this discussion. Um, we have had, you know, you see the list here of the restaurants and bars who have stated that they are interested in doing this, okay? So, Several restaurants that we had initially reached out to are not interested for various different reasons. So some of the other restaurants, um, a for instance, um, it is my understanding that Roosters would take their spots and sublease them to the Oxford Grill House. They don't want to do outdoor dining, but they would sublease. Um, I think that there are several other bars that are talking about that. I'm not sure if that will work or not, but my question to you is, are you okay with them subleasing? Uh, you know, one thing that we have talked about, what, what, I, what I don't want to see happen is someone says, I'm subleasing this person's two spots, and then that person sees how effective this is, and is like, wait, now I wanna do it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think that you would have to have that person sign off that they understand that their two spots are then taken so y'all help me with that that was one that i just couldn't speak on your behalf at the meeting i need your input the 26 spots are the 26 spots so if somebody subleases their spot then i mean let those two individuals deal with not us well the problem i'm looking at right here i'd like to see roosters move around the site anyway because they're locking yes we don't have to move down the street but we can move down the street Well, I'll tell you why we, why we did that. This is not written in stone. Any of this can move. So that, those are the suggestions we want you to make. Um, on that uh, side street, you see if Julep takes two and St. Leo Lounge takes two, that eliminates that whole side of parking. If you put people on the other side of the street, it makes a very narrow path for a car. So it is much safer for us to move those to those other spots. And we believe that it's safer for them in waiting on tables to not be going to two separate areas outside for all four spaces to be together. So that's why we moved them, Rick. I mean, they can, yeah. you know, we can be talked out of it, but that just, that's the reasoning. Those four spots could be 
I mean, you can determine that you won't allow people to sublease if you don't prefer to do that. Um, I think from a safety standpoint, it is safer for those, from what Jimmy and Bart are telling me, that's the safer option, but um, Pope. Yeah, I, Bart and I have talked about this, and I've talked about this with John Mayo. The subleasing gets very difficult to regulate who's under control at what moment, when did they sublease, and to whom. And a lot of landlords don't allow it. And if I were the city, if you want your two, you can have them. If you don't, and if you all want to give somebody that third or fourth to another okay. business, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not getting in the way of, of people having more than two, but I wouldn't do it through a sublease. Yeah, Y'all keep control. control of it so that you've got attached to your lease that business's approved footprint for that four no, that instead of sense. trying to work through sublease of insurance. Yeah. I, I guess my concern well, then is the, that- Then the guy could sublease it for more. Yes. Yeah, then you start getting people who are trying to buy them up or they're subleasing it for one night for one party, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, and- the, Now that makes liquor, sense. The liquor license expansion is going to get complicated if you start subleasing. How do you it, deal it, with that? It is, and I, and I don't. I just don't want y'all to have to get involved in all yeah. that. No, we should. They might could do that, but at the end, it's simpler for y'all to attach to your lease their approved form That's right. for their places that you gave them, and everybody gets the option of these two if they don't want it. Then don't. But take I think it. we should actually have those businesses sign off that they don't want it because I don't, right. I don't want to sublease to someone and give up more spots and then that restaurant that had originally said no now wants to. You That's know right. what I'm saying? I want, I want to leave it open for those restaurants to decide they want to do it or either say, no, I don't. I mean, I, I'm fine with us doing I, I, it instead I, I, of subleasing, but I'm not fine with us taking up more spaces than two per restaurant. Does that make sense? Do, yeah. I mean, that's what we... Let, 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 you know, what about, though, I think there should be some kind of consideration given to people that are in the same building with each other. And I'm not talking about subleasing, but, I mean, it seems to me that if somebody like uh, Roosters wants to say, I'd like the city to be, I want to give the option to the city to be able to give uh, Oxford Grill House my, you know, then I think we should give that kind of stuff consideration just because they are in the same building. And I think other buildings should be able to do the same thing. I think you get right back into that sublease part. Yeah. Yeah. All these same buildings, yeah. yeah. All these so say every building's connected. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, every block is in the same building. Yeah. That's really a policy concern. I think that there's I think you're exactly right, Pope, and I, I think that it is, um, tell me if this would make it easier, because I'm not opposed to a restaurant having more spaces if those are available, I'm just opposed to it being subleased, like you're saying, because it causes us those problems in enforcement. So um, would the best way be to say, and I'm not picking on, not picking on you, Scott Michaels, but I've gotten a word from you, so I'm <laughs> using you as my example. But the, um, if Scott decided that he was, that it, Roosters did not want two spots, um, would we get him to sign something and confirm that so that if Clint Boutwell said, actually, I want four, he can have that. How do, how do we go about that? Yes. We, um, I don't know what, legally how to do it. What John and I talked about is we can sell these as leases or licenses. And instead of selling it as a lease, we could set it as a license. You all could reserve in, in yourselves the right to terminate the license within 10 days. You don't have to do this. So you can, if this goes wonky, you ought to be able to get out of it. So you reserve and you, you tell them that that they have to give you two weeks notice. Although, if they give you notice the night before a meeting, I don't need these anymore. And you can waive the two weeks requirement and let them out that day and give it to somebody else who wants it. That's, that's easy to, to just let the, and, and if they decide they don't wanna use it and they wanna just own it and pay for it and keep their competitor from using it, I guess if we find that they're not using it and it's just being used as a competitive disadvantage that we could we could terminate the license and let the person whose business it parallels use. But it does seem to me that if somebody wants to pay for all four and the other, as you said, says they don't want to pay for the two in front of them, that's fine. We'll do a license for all four 
as long as you're gonna use it. If you don't, then we'll pull the license for the two you're not using it and make it available to somebody and, who will. And I think that the spaces that we're talking about have to be adjacent to your business. Absolutely. So we right. can't have businesses Somebody from across them. town saying, right. I don't I don't want to use mine down South Lamar. You can use yours on Van Buren. You know, I mean I think that we can't because then we are blocking other businesses. The way that yeah. this worked, you know, numerous businesses have said that they need the restaurants to be active because that's the walk by traffic that they get for sales all day every day and they they understand the importance but i don't i don't want to see us get to where three restaurants on south lamar donate theirs to one not donate but say we don't want ours and then right. we end up taking the parking from in front of stores the way that this worked was that they be directly in front of whatever business they are serving and that's gonna i, I think that's a necessity because of the expansion of the footprint of their liquor license. I would think so too. I don't understand how you could get the ABC license for your sub lessee. Your sub lessee would have that and it would have to be in their name. I, I, I don't know any of that. Well, and ABC will work that out. That's right. You know, those, those are, we know that ABC has said that they would expand their footprint to allow their current license to accommodate. I don't know what that looks like and right. that's not our part. So I'm just, right. you know, let's figure out what we are okay with as far as spaces go. So um, I think that we've pretty much talked ourselves out of subleasing just for the simple fact that we need to be able to know exactly who is utilizing. There's no reason for somebody else to sublease it. We should just, if we're okay with more than two spots, we should be able to make that That's decision. Right. We'll just include in the license right. and lease. And for y'all to know, we're gonna describe these by the parking number on the parking meter instead of a survey or something else. Okay, we, perfect. So then I need y'all's feedback. As you see, Julep and St. Leo Lounge over there on Jackson Avenue East, if they each get two spots, that's all four spots in front of that block. We believe it would be too narrow to put two on the side of Grill House under Roosters right there. So they would need to come out in front. That being said, are you all opposed to those being used? Archer Grill House and Rooster. I, no, I'm not, because of the safety issues if we put it on the side. Yeah. I think this is the best area with what we're working with. Okay, then let's, okay, you see round tables two there in the front. You see city grocery with two, I'm just kind of going around the circle. The McEwen's two are parallel, so you see how those line up. Um, then you see we have St. Leo, St. Leo and St. Leo's Lounge have traded spots. So St. Leo's is now, the restaurant is now in the larger space that's the old Oxford Eagle. So you see there that um, they would prefer to use this loading zone than the spaces out in front. Where, see on 10th Street? Where is the loading zone? That right where you see the blue mark, it's on top of it. Oh, okay. And so instead of being out front, they would prefer to use their side door and use that as their out, outdoor dining. And Mary, just for the record, that loading zone, if you still allow traffic but that's right, yes, and it allows, with the reason it's backed up so far from the corner is because it's backed up enough that if it's left there seven days a week that an 18-wheeler can still, turn, a delivery yeah. truck can still turn there and go through, yes. So that is, um, that is where they would prefer to do it, which I'm great with. I'm just making sure y'all are. We have the cafe lights over that alley there, so it, it gives it a nice ambiance, and it also saves parking spots. Sure. In front of the businesses that are right there. So that would be the equivalent of two spots. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. The, I guess the annex and rafters, I mean, they're all good with the loading zone being taken? I don't know that they, I have not asked them. I'm just thinking through loading zone, or when you're in and out of this. Yeah. No, I mean, that's a fair question. I have not. This is the, this map got finished about 10 minutes before this meeting. So we have not looked at this map with anyone else, and we will do that between now and the next meeting to, so that as we do leases, we, we have that ironed out. But 
Um, so here is another issue that we run into. We've heard from Lee Harris and he wants to, we've heard from Tangos who wants to, I mean, yeah, Griffin Tanner wants to. Raptors and the Annex are both Hudson Chadwick. He would like two for each. And then Griffin would like one for the seller. Well, about where that 18 wheeler is parked, that delivery truck is parked on 10th Street, that's the entrance to the seller is there. So we had originally, he had originally said that he wanted them out here on Jackson Avenue East. Um, he also owns Tango's, but they're just, there are only eight spots there and there are four businesses, you know, that those are right at their front door. So an option for the seller would be the other loading zone. You see where St. Leo's is, where you see these other, this other truck, pickup truck parked uh, along the side of the old bus depot. There's another loading zone there that could be the seller. Just throwing that out there to y'all. There's no, I mean, for the sellers to be right at their door or up against their building is not an option because it, it's in that basement right down there. So St. Leo's a loading zone. And we're not taking, if the seller's a loading zone, we're not taking parking spaces out of, out of circulation. We're just so we're eliminating really a loading zone. If we take both of those loading zones, right now they would utilize the loading zone that I'm talking about for the seller. They may have to roll it on their cart a little further, but they still have a place to pull over and unload. If we take that loading zone out of the mix, to put the seller there, but there just aren't any parking spots associated with the seller to give them. I mean, that's... Well, the, good, the good thing is the seller only wants there is Thursday through Saturday. So that loading zone would be point. that loading zone would be available you know expecting through thursday at lunchtime or thursday afternoon because they probably wouldn't start doing that till evening anyway so that would be yeah. something that monday through yeah, thursday afternoon that loading zone would be available on 10th yep yeah. so we will talk to him about what the times look like and that kind of thing um, one point um, that Kara brought up about the ones that we are that we are saying we lease them for three days. What if somebody's parked in that spot when it's time for them to do that on Thursday? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, we need to think through um, exactly how that works because if they're only leasing them for three days of the week, we could likely get into a, a situation every once in a while where there's a car in one of those spots on Thursday when it's time for them to be setting up. So we need to think through that in our leases of the ones that are only gonna be three days a week, what that looks like. Okay. That's a good point, Mayor. Um, so. Bag and meter is about the only thing you can do first thing Thursday morning. If the diesel is left there from Wednesday night, then we get in trouble because we don't want to park the diesel on Thursday or Friday. No, so I don't either. I guess it's We saw how well that I think it ought to be up to the businesses that aren't leasing them full time. That burden should be put back on us. That the ones that are leasing full time, the barricades will be up. Yeah. So well, I think that ought to be. Can we get those signs made up as far as those that are part out of the lease if they won't go home? Yeah. 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 Yeah, you know, one question that we got was, do we still get our curbside pickup when we have this? And I had said that I did not believe that was the board's intention, that it was either or. You could lease two spots to utilize them full time. When we have established those for curbside pickup, those are not removed from our parking inventory. Right. They are specified for a specific type of parking, but they, you know, that has not required us to make a donation or to, um, to uh, appraise and, and set them aside for lease because they are still in the parking inventory. So I just wanted to clear that up with y'all. I told them that I did not believe it was the board's intention to give you 
two curbside spots along with this. And in many of the cases, that's just not even possible based on the parking spots that are there. I suppose they could, no, I don't know. I was gonna say, could they be used for curbside when they are not, but then it's the getting the hoods back on and off of those yeah. um, meters. Well, they and to, I mean. I guess they could just the leave them there all the time. You all will decide whether when you enter into these leases, you want to take your curbside out of the reserve status and put it back in as normal parking. If you leave those that aren't used as part of this inventory, then those curbside pickups will still be available. Okay. That's, That's right. And I've had I've had one I've had one restaurant tell me that they are doing about seventy percent of their business curbside still. Yeah. And so they don't want to lose those curbside spots by going to outdoor dining for fear that their business drops off so much because of the inconvenience of curbside pickup. So that what Rick? Signage, it takes a signage issue right out if you leave it. They have curbside or they have, if they rent it, it's a pretty nice, you know, outdoor dining signage up. They have them, but they can't be parked there. Just leave the hoods on seven days a week. They'll probably get on that. Yeah. If we're leaving everybody else. I mean, anyone that wants it. We're, we're, we've, we've got a few curbside spots marked for businesses that I'm not sure they use them anymore, but, and we need to do a reevaluation of that. Um, but yeah, that would, that would solve it as long as it's curbside the rest of the time, okay? Um, all right, so we know that, um, especially for the next month or so while it's still so hot, that there will need to be some type of coverage tent you know, something many of them will want to put out there to encourage people to sit outside. That being said, um, tents are very expensive. Some of the businesses have said, you know, they can't really invest in a tent not knowing how long this is gonna be going on, so they'd be renting one. Several of the distributors, alcohol and beer distributors, have offered to donate tents to them, but that means that that tent's gonna say Tito's on the side or Bud Light or whatever it says. That would not normally be what we would choose um, as far as signage goes in our downtown area, but I also believe that this is a time that we need to allow them to do things as economically as they can, and if someone's donating the tent, I told them I didn't have a problem with it, but I needed to ask y'all so that- I move we let all the tents with the, sign, with the logos. Okay. Well, I think it's already covered under your suspension of the temporary sign. That's right. Yeah. There. there you yeah. go, perfect. Um, all right. So, um, just real quick before we get there, if you're putting up tents as you get into Christmas season, think about your tents having a problem with your lights that are going across and all the pickup trucks. Well, sorry to bring that up already. No, that's that's a great it's a great thought. I've been thinking that I just don't like that look when the lights come out, but the I haven't thought about it from. I don't, are they high enough to? Uh, hey, hey, Mayor, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that last thing when you said it was a good thought. I couldn't hear somebody back there said it. Oh, uh, Rick was just talking about the tents once the Christmas lights go up. Would there be any conflict between the tops of the tents and the lights? No. We don't think there would be, but, um, you know, that is one thing. Once they put those tents up, it's going to be dark under those tents at night without some type of lighting. So I don't know how that'll work. Um, okay, next is uh, the only spot that I know of looking at this that is a handicapped spot is the one in front of Funky's. It may be one in front of the grill house also. I'm not having to have it. Okay. What we had planned to do if it meets your approval is put a handicapped spot um, on the other side of the street. So that we're not losing a handicapped spot, but we're moving it. I think that's appropriate. To an appropriate spot across the street. It doesn't make sense for somebody to be walking across to serve food on the other side of the street back and forth. So is that okay with y'all? Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. Um, and I would say that the, you know, we, we talked about it being for three months. And, uh, you know, I just want to make sure y'all agree this goes for the exact same time as restaurants are open it is the same alcohol ordinances that apply inside the restaurants will have to work out with abc 
I saw some comments today by one uh, restaurant owner that was saying there's no way that ABC will allow this to happen. And, you know, we, we can't promise ABC is going to do anything, but they have insinuated that they would be, you know, amenable to ext extending the already in place permit to a, a larger footprint. Yeah. So that is, that is our understanding. We don't have any authority to make that happen. That will be on each restaurant owner to facilitate with ABC, but that, that is our understanding. Um, any other, oh, the appraisal fee, remember that um, by statute, we have to add the appraisal fee, one of the appraisals, is that the average of the two appraisal fees and then And so based upon how many spaces are rented, you know, or leased, I think that is, that fee will have to be dispersed. Um, I think I mentioned this to y'all, I mentioned it to the restaurant owners, but I spoke to the wise women, um, not this past Friday, but the one before, and we were talking about ways to help our local businesses right now, and several members insinuated that they would love to see us do an adopt a restaurant program, kind of like an adopt a highway program, where they could help some of these restaurants with the cost of providing outdoor dining. So I'm hopeful that some restaurant owners will be connected with those folks so that they can get that in place, and perhaps that would be the first the first order of business is to get the um, the appraisal fee out of the way. Anything else? Bart, have I forgotten anything? Okay. There will probably still be a, a couple of questions or options on Tuesday, but we will try to have <coughs> them before Tuesday. Right. Okay. Good progress. Yes, I thank you all for this special meeting. It will help us get these restaurants started more quickly. Anybody else have anything? <coughs> I don't believe there's anything to consider an executive session for. Could I have a motion to adjourn? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The Aye. meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Aye.